Breaking Barriers, NASA's Science Superstar. My name is Christine Darden and I worked at NASA Langley Research Center for nearly 40 years. My job is cooler than science fiction. NASA, or the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, is the United States Space Agency. In the 1960s, scientists at NASA were working like crazy. They were competing with the Soviet Union, a union of 15 countries dominated by Russia, to be the first country to send an astronaut to the moon. They walked on the moon two years after I got here. Getting humans into space took many years and a lot of work. But this achievement wouldn't have been possible without the help of computers. But back then, computers weren't the machines we know today. They were human. And when I say computer in my discussions, I'm talking about the human computers. Machine computers, IBMs, and things like that were just beginning to work their way into the workplace at that time. Computer was really mostly females, mostly ladies, who did the computing for the engineers. And it was, at that time, generally using a mechanical calculator and a big spreadsheet that they filled out. At science labs across the country, female human computers did math, lots of it. They analyzed data, solved equations, and created graphs of detailed flight paths called trajectories. Male engineers often said the female human computers did the math more rapidly and accurately than they could. Being a human computer was a special job. For women at the time, a human computing job was considered prestigious, high paying, and could even be considered a service to our country. At the time, most women didn't work outside the home. Women who did only had a few jobs to choose from, like teacher or secretary. Most human computers were white women. But because of a labor shortage during World War II, Virginia's Langley Research Center began hiring black women as human computers too. For women like Christine, being a human computer provided a rare opportunity. That's because she grew up during a time when much of the American South was segregated. This meant that black people were forced to use separate bathrooms, attend separate schools, and sit separately on buses from white people. I can remember only once riding a bus in 60 with a niece about 13 years younger than I was riding down to Abilene, Texas. And the bus stopped, the bus filled up, and the bus driver did come. We were at the front of the area in which blacks were sitting, and he came and asked us to get up and go in the back so that the white people could sit there. So I remembered that. I didn't like that, but I was down in the middle of Texas by myself with this child, and I didn't want to get in any trouble down there. We put up with those things, and, and often we didn't make waves because we didn't want to for anything to happen to us You know, when we were down there alone. When I was growing up, I didn't interact with many whites. I lived in a black neighborhood. The school was across the street. Education was a high priority in my home, and all my sisters and brothers ahead of me had finished school before I even went. When we were in the segregated schools in the South, the teachers always told us that there was this perception, you know, that whites were smarter than we were. We didn't have the best chemistry labs. We, you know, our textbooks might have been used and old and everything like that. But they, they continued to give us an advice. And they would tell us, you're going to have to work harder. You're going to have to run faster to make it in the white world. Christine took the advice of her teachers. She worked hard, graduating first in her high school class at 15 years old. I went to a boarding school in the 11th grade um, in Asheville, North Carolina, and I really fell in love with geometry there, and I think that really sealed my love for math. Before my love for math, I think I had thought about, you know, becoming a doctor, but I found out maybe with the geometry and some of my other experiences that I liked physical sciences better than I did the biological sciences. I declared math as my major and physics as my minor. I was prepared to be a math teacher and I t 
took a job in Brunswick County, Virginia, and at, at the same time work on a master's degree in, turns out it was applied mathematics. Applied mathematics takes mathematics and applies it to a real world situation, such that when you get the answer to your math equations, you got the answers to a real world problem. Shortly after graduating, Christine applied for a job at NASA and was offered a position. I came to NASA in June of 1967. I was 25 years old and I was hired into a job as a data analyst, but I actually worked in what they call the computer office. By the time I came in 67, the, the office was integrated. Uh, there were blacks and whites in the office that I went into. I had a white head computer. And I actually got into the programming pretty soon after I got here, so I mostly wrote programs, computer programs for, um, for the engineers that came into the office. Christine loved her work, but she was eager to do more. She didn't just want to process flight data for other engineers. She wanted to create it herself. You know, it's got a physics in it, it's got the math in it. I could do that. So she decided to become an engineer with the highest degree you could earn, a PhD. The hardest part of it was that I knew that my class was gonna be all white males and me, and that's exactly what it was. The first class I walked in was maybe seven or eight guys and me, and I had been told how smart white guys were. And, and, and here I am going into a class with all white guys. What does that really mean? And so that was a tough decision to make, but once I made it, then my, my focus was on doing the work. I don't think any of them said anything to me at first. I did fine, you know, in the first test. And then one or two of the guys came over and said, hey, do you want to join our study group? I said, yeah, that would be great. I entered the PhD program in about 1973, and I did not graduate until 83. During her career at NASA, Christine studied supersonic flight. That's when a plane flies faster than the speed of sound, which is about 760 miles an hour at sea level. Today, we usually don't see supersonic planes in the air. That's because of a loud shockwave that's produced. It's called a sonic boom. The sonic boom is a noise that is generated when an airplane goes faster than the speed of sound. It sounds like a boom or a, a, a loud crack. Scientists haven't quite figured out how to reduce the sonic boom, but they're getting close. As a pioneer in supersonic flight, Christine's research played an important part in those developments. After nearly 40 years, Christine retired from NASA in 2007. She was the first black female at NASA Langley to be promoted to a senior leadership role. And it all began with a curiosity that was sparked during her career as a human computer. Like so many other women in this role, their work was crucial in the advancement of NASA's space program and the future of modern aviation. Folks say you ought to have a passion about what you do because if you have that passion, you never work a day in your life because you're always just, it's what you are. And it's something that you enjoy doing and you love getting out of the bed every morning to go and do.